You know, I joked in my yearly wrap up that sometimes it seems like viewers on YouTube love a good negative video. So I said, hey, if I took that same video where I said, these are the 15 worst books I've read since I started this channel, and I made the exact opposite and said, these are the 15 best books that I've read since I started the channel, that it wouldn't do nearly as much traffic. So uh, let's find out. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike coming at you with another Positive Vibes video today. This time we'll be talking about the 15 best books I've read since I began this channel. Now, if you don't know, I began the channel in April of 2019, and I'm going to be pilfering through 332 books I have read in that time span. Now, I do want to put an emphasis on the fact that these are going to be new books for me. What I mean by that is no rereads, because I wore, I did do a lot of rereads, a lot of Stephen King, a lot of Michael Crichton, a lot of Joe Abercrombie, stuff that I had already read before, especially when I first started the channel. So I'm not going to be counting those. Also, I do have a rule in place that annoys a lot of people, but I think I have to do it this way, because if not, I feel like the list would just be dominated by specific authors. I do one book per author and that makes it very very tough so uh they're not ranked i'm just going to kind of talk about the 15 best i think since april 2019 when i began this channel and i'm going to do that by year i think is the best way so let's begin all the way back guys in 2019 i really did cut my teeth on being a booktuber on the wheel of time series so i have to go with my favorite Wheel of Time book during that time span, and now it hasn't changed. That is The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan. I love this book because while I felt like Eye of the World, book number one, that series was very much just a, hey, remember how much you love Lord of the Rings? Yeah, I think you'll like this too. Book two is where Robert Jordan took a hard left and created his own thing and made it very, very different. And even though there were many adventures I loved along the way, there probably are maybe better books in that series. I would always say Great Hunt will always be my favorite, mostly because of that flicker flicker scene. I, that is one that's just imprinted in my memory. Never forget. And it easily made its way to the top of my list as one of my favorite fantasy books of all time. So I love The Great Hunt. I feel like they split up the traveling parties just right. It had a perfect three-act structure. I loved everything about it, and I would love... I wouldn't read... I'd read it again. I would read it again. It's that good. Without reading the entire series, I would read just The Great Hunt again because I liked it that much. Also in 2019, uh, one of the best sci-fi books that I've read in my lifetime, and I'm talking about Golden Sun by Pierce Brown. Now with Red Rising, we are doing a reread right now, by the way. If you want to join us, you can join the Discord. I got the links down below. You can join us in the Discord. We've already reread the first book, which you can fly through really quick. But when I did read Red Rising, the original book in the series, it was I was kind of lukewarm on it. I wasn't sure how I felt I went into it with a different set of expectations, and what I got wasn't exactly what I was sold. So I was kind of, oh, I'm not really sure how it felt. And here's the thing. I did not even plan to continue with that series, except I had already paid a decent amount of money for the first four books in hardcover. And I said, well, I paid this much for them. I might as well at least give the second book a try. And the second book completely melted my face off. And now Red Rising is one of my favorite series of all time. I love it to death. I will always be an advocate for it. I always will try and get more of you to read it. So Golden Sun, I think what this did, it just took it, everything that I did want in book one, it gave me and more. It expanded this world in such an amazing way. It got off of Mars. It went around our solar system. It introduced dozens of new characters that will just basically be a part of my personal pop culture at this point. I love everything about this series. and all really did start for me with Golden Sun, just an action-packed, thrill ride that will grab you from the first chapter and not let go until that crazy cliffhanger of an ending that it has. So Golden Sun, without a doubt, I mean, that's still one of my favorite books that I have read in like the last five years. It is very much towards the top. That's why I had to include it here. But also in 2019, while I had read the original trilogy and I reread the original trilogy, I had never read the standalones before I started this channel. And very, very early in the process, when I switched from Wheel of Time to say, hey, do people like First Law? Let's see if it's Wheel of Time or do people... Am I actually good at this? You know, people want to hear me talk about other series. And First Law was the first one. So Best Served Cold is the one that I'm going to pick here because I I think that this book actually does stand right next to the original trilogy when it comes to the First Law. 
for several reasons. Uh, I mean, look, I love The Count of Monte Cristo. It's one of my favorite classic books of all time. And I very much felt like this was Joe Abercrombie writing The Count of Monte Cristo in his world. And I thought that really did hit all those beats. But what I love about it is it took some characters like a, 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 a Nicomo Casca, like a, a Call Shivers, and that were kind of, you know, background characters in the original trilogy, gave them their moment to shine and made them amazing characters, showed that Casca actually did have a little bit more of a heart of gold than just the ruthless mercenary that he seemed like. It showed that Call Shivers was more than just discount Logan Nine Fingers. It gave these characters a ton of depth. And I just, I will never forget how much fun I had reading that book. I think it's the fastest paced first law book out there. And I never think any of them are really slow, but that is without a doubt the one that is just an absolute page turn. You cannot stop. And for the first time, it really took us around the map. That's what I really wanted with that book. And he did it. And I think it's just an amazing, amazing book. And anyone who loved the first law trilogy, if you, it's weird because I'll see people who love Best Serve Cold, people who can't stand it. For me, like I said, uh, I, I think it took Nakomo Casca up to one of my favorite characters in that whole series. And uh, yeah, that's all I can say all i need is a really good character hook and with those two characters expanding on them i think he really did actually bring it around how about 2020 guys that year we don't like to talk about well some good things did happen that year like i started reading the dresden files in fact i read all of the dresden files that were out in 2020 and it's going to be the popular pick guys but the reason the thing is is this book has so much expect like seriously you start reading Dresden Files and people tell you, wait till you get the changes. So changes is the book I'm picking. But here's the thing. Yes, it's the popular pick. But you know what? It's popular for a reason. It is that good. And you think this book had that mountain of expectations on it when I started reading it. And it exceeded them somehow. Yes. Changes is absolutely the book that took Dresden Files from really good to amazing, like one of the best series that I was reading. So uh, I, I, I don't know how else to sell it outside of like everything that you thought you knew about Dresden Files really does get turned upside down in that story. And it's done in a way that's completely earned. It isn't just like, hey, we need change for change's sake. It's all earned and it's all for a good reason. And the series has continued to evolve since then. But yeah, one of the most amazing, amazing modern fantasy books I've read it is Changes. It really does check every box of what you're looking for and just uh, really, a, if there was a thriller version of a fantasy book, that would be it. So that book was just fast paced. It had the ups and it had the downs. It had the heartbreaks. It had the the heartbreaks again. It had lots of things that would really just blow your mind. And uh, there's a reason that I have uh, me not only due to request, me reading the uh, first chapter and me reading the last two chapters live on camera on the channel. And that's actually how Jim Butcher discovered the channel. So uh, yeah, amazing, amazing book. And uh, it, it deserves all the accolades that it gets. So I'm sorry if that's a trendy pick, but it, it would be hard to pick anything else. John Gwynn was an author I really got into in 2020 and Faithful in the Fallen is going to be, it's one of my top 10 fantasy series without a doubt. So picking a favorite one of those was actually kind of tough, I think, because I think each one of those books has something I thought that really, it brought something special to the series. But for me, I think I have to go with Ruin. The reason I'm going with Ruin is because I think at this point, you had the culmination of all, you had these different parties and you were kind of waiting for them all to kind of meet up. So this is kind of the Convergence book, but also where some things kind of, uh, reach a climax with certain characters and also a turning point, a point of no return for others. You know, the, the redemption arc didn't quite maybe go as you planned or, you know, it is a point where, you know, some of our, our, our young kids have stepped up now to become the leaders and have, have really started to get a, a massive following. And it has some crazy twists and reveals that will absolutely stun you. And again, another ending that will make you be reaching for book four as soon as you dry your eyes. Amazing, amazing book. But John Gwynn is an author that's automatic for me, but it is really hard picking a favorite one, uh, just one, honestly, by John Gwynn. But I think I would have to go with Ruin just for all of those reasons. One of the most fun reads I've done since I started this channel was Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Eames. Now look, I'm a big, big classic rock guy, big time, huge. And the fact that he took a fantasy book and put all of these classic rock kind of Easter eggs into it that you didn't need to know to enjoy the book, but if you did, it made it so much better. And he treated this fantasy traveling band as if they were like a rock band that was a little past their prime having like a reunion tour, going out one more time to show these kids how it's done. The way he's able to make that into a cohesive fantasy tale is just thrilling. I love, I had so much fun 
reading that book. But it's not just goofy. It's not slapstick. It's very serious. Dark shit happens in it. There is some really, really messed up things in it, but I am having fun the entire time. And I, I, personally, I've been waiting to see an owlbear forever. So, you know what? Props to Nicholas Eames uh, for doing that because I, I, I can't wait to uh, hopefully browbeat him into eventually writing a story of the Bard's Tale. You know, he talks about the Bards in that book that traveled with the band in their prime to write that little spinoff book from the Bard's point of view about Saga. I would love that to happen. You know, as of right now, he's saying no. But, you know, I've had him on the channel twice. You know, maybe third time is a charm. I can convince him to do that. Let's move along, guys, to 20. 21. Now, going by the numbers here, this is my most happy reading year because I have the most entries off. I have six of them from 2021. And that began with Revival by Stephen King. Yes, this was one that I didn't read when it came out. This was during my breakup period. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, uh, I did a video a while back, like a long time ago, about how I became a constant reader and what happened to me during like my breakup phase, as I called it, which was after I finished Dark Tower. And I was so frustrated with him, I didn't read him for like seven, eight years. And this was during that span. So I, I missed this upon original release. My guy, Jaime Fuego, over on the Horror Channel, who is like my sigh on all things Stephen King, he convinced me. He was like, look, I get where you're coming from. I was frustrated at the end of Dark Tower 2, but he's like, if you're going to go back and read anything during that span, and this was between Dark Tower 7 and 11, 22, 63, he said, you've got to do Revival, because I think you would absolutely dig Revival. And I did. This was showing that Stephen King was still the absolute master at slice of life and character work. He just wants, you just want to spend time with the characters in his books. And he does that. He will go from this person from childhood to like retirement age. And you just want to spend time with that character. And he does it perfect there. One of the darkest books, believe it or not, that King has written, but one of the darkest endings without a doubt. I know everybody has hot takes about King's endings. See what you think of this one. Because man, it will punch you in the mouth. So, so good. And that was just showing me that, hey, King still had quite, quite a lot of muscle to flex during that time period. Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir just barely edged out The Martian. Now with me, I said when it came out that I didn't think it was better than The Martian, but I felt like it was in the discussion. Only one of these books uh, drew a manly man tear from my eyes, and that was Project Hail Mary because the ending was so beautiful. I thought Project Hail Mary was such a fun buddy cop in space kind of movie movie a book it felt very cinematic and they are making a movie so that's what we were talking about like what are they going to do when they make the movie i think project Hail mary was just a blast i think i read that in like two sittings so much fun and i can't give anything away because guys it's so so much better if you go into project Hail mary completely blind not knowing anything on what it's about just know it is another man goes into space man gets in trouble kind of book and if you love that i think you're going to dig this because it has a relationship in the book that is just magnificent and you will absolutely be there for it all of the way so so good it was my book of the year honestly for 2021 which at the beginning of the year i would have never told you that but it was just that good dark matter by blake crouch guys this was the first book i read by blake crouch and if you've been keeping up with the channel at all you know that now i am a crouch potato i've read eight blake crouch books and i've loved them all and I, I, while I said I was a little disappointed with uh, with Abandon, it's just because of a book like Dark Matter, which sets the bar so high. It's still my favorite Blake Crouch book. For years, I had been looking for someone to kind of take those big empty shoes that Michael Crichton left behind and see if he could fit in them. And I think that Blake Crouch is a guy that's finally going to do it. He has the perfect mix of the techno thriller while adding in a very, very high, high uh, scientific themes into his books and putting them in a way that uh, layman can understand. That's what I always say. I've always loved the ideas of like infinite realities and there being, you know, like an Earth 2 or 3 that is almost exactly like this, except one tiny little difference and it changes everything. But there might be someone exactly like you that's made all the same exact decisions. And it, it's, it, it kind of focuses on those things and like what kind of happens if someone is kind of lost out of their own reality and they're trying to find a specific reality when there are infinite realities. So it's one of those kind of books that'll make your head hurt, but it also just completely wow you. Just so good, guys. Amazing. If you haven't read uh, Dark Matter yet, I think you'll become a very, very big Blake Crouch fan after if you give it a shot. Hyperion by Dan Simmons. This is one that was on my sci-fi bucket list. I had wanted to read this for like 20 plus years. Don't know why I kept putting it off, but I finally made it a point to do it in 2021. 2021, and it met every 
It exceeded every expectation I had for it. It is basically the sci-fi version of the Canterbury Tales, and it is amazing where it has like these six or seven different pilgrims telling their story about how they got to the point where they're at when the story starts, and it's so good. Each story is very different, so it does feel like numerous stories wrapped into one, and you think this, you could go through and you could rank those stories. They're all really good, though, but everyone kind of has their favorite, and there are some, there's some dad shit in there, as I like to call it, man, that really, really hit me right here. It's such a good, good story, and I said, besides Dune and Ender's Game, this is probably my favorite science fiction book of all time. That's how good Hyperion was. So much so that I went and got a print of the, uh, the Shrike, because I just thought that, that that cover art was just so amazing. So uh, yeah, uh, if you haven't read Hyperion, do yourself a favor. Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. You could tell I was doing Sci-Fi September that year, because I do have some, uh, well, four Sci-Fi books on here where I do tend to lean mostly fantasy. Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke was a surprise to me, because I think I had planned to read 2001, and then uh, my buddy Moyd over at Media Death Cult, he was gonna be doing a read-along, and I said, okay, I'll do Childhood's End, why not? I'm so glad I did. Because here we are over a year and a half later, and that book still, the themes in it, the ideas in it have not left my head. So many big thoughts in that. And what I've always said is like, look, if you write a book and you write crappy characters and I don't care about your characters, I don't really care about your story unless you have an incredible idea. And R.C. Clark had an incredible idea. Like I can't tell you one character's name in this book in my memory, but what I do remember is the story and the ideas of what would happen to humanity if we had no more strife, no more struggle. What would happen to us? Would we lose our identities? Would we lose our creativity? So many things that I think that the wrong way could be considered preachy, but he does them in such a thought-provoking way that I just, I'll never stop thinking about it. That book is amazing. And I can't see how anything else he wrote is better than that. If it is, it might actually just actually blow my mind. It might actually blow my mind. I don't know because, like I said, this long and I'm still thinking about that book. Just so, so good, guys. Make it a point to read that if you haven't. And the last one for 2021, guys, Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I know a lot of you out there think that you're too good for great Jay Kristoff, and I get that. That's fine. If you, if you already have preconceived notions about Jay Kristoff, I'm never going to be able to change your mind. What I'll tell you is I, too, saw the cover of Empire of the Vampire and was like, Great, a shirtless vampire with a bunch of tattoos looking all sexy. I wonder what kind of book this is going to be. So I wrote it off. I wrote it off. And then my guy Mark over at Slowly Red did a review for it, and he just gushed about this book. And I was like, you know, I've been waiting for vampires to be scary again for a long, long time. And so I picked it up, and I blew through that book. I ate it up. I loved it so much. I immediately contacted the author and asked him to come on the channel and talk to me about it because I thought it was just so, so good. And I, I've read uh, what is Nevernight Chronicle after that. I loved it so much. Empire of the Vampire is very much if uh, Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire and Stephen King's Salem Lot. Salem's Lot had a baby. I feel like that's what that book would be because it has all those amazing characters like you would expect in something like Salem's Lot and also has this vampire kind of recounting how he got to this position in his life story. It's really, really good, guys. It's fantastic. Yeah, it has crass language. If you don't like crass language, you're not going to like Jay Kristoff. It's just part of the thing. I think it's awesome. You're reading an adult vampire book. And you know what? People cuss. It does happen. So I, I think it's great. And I, I think everyone I've really convinced to read it just about has said it was great. But I know there are still some some snobs on the book tube who will just say, oh, I just don't like Jay Kristoff. That's fine. They're, they're allowed. They're allowed. There's authors everybody else loves that I don't. It happens. But I, I feel like the, the Jay Kristoff narrative is all wrong. It is all wrong. And start with Empire of the Vampire. It is an ex exceptional book. And I cannot wait for part two, hopefully, coming out this year. How about 2022, guys? If you watch my top 10 of the year, you know my favorite book of all of 2022 was going to be on this list. That is Swan Song by Robert McCammon, a book that I think had a mountain of expectations because people always compared it to The Stand, one of my favorite Stephen King books. And while I'm reading, I'm like, yeah, I can definitely see those, but I, I will say I do feel like they're two very different beasts. And also, you don't got to pick one, guys. It's okay to like both. You know what? Because I love both of them. I love them both. And I love them both for different reasons and some of the same reasons. But what makes Swan Song so great is that you feel like you have gone to hell and back with those characters. And you want to see them succeed. You love how much they just keep fighting. They never give up. And you want to see them. They just keep striving for hope in a hopeless world. And you just want to see 
what's over that next hill kind of thing with them. Maybe, maybe one more day if we make it one more day. And it's just, it's such an amazing journey. You really do get so connected to those characters that you want to see what happens and you want to see them succeed and you're heartbroken when they don't and you're overjoyed when they do. And if the ending doesn't bring you to tears, I don't know how because I have, don't think I've ever read a 900 page book that flew by that quick. I could not stop turning the pages. I zipped through that book. And you know what? I'd read it again. It could have been a thousand pages longer and I kept reading it. So I, I think Robert McCampbell was kind of like my big surprise this year because uh, I love that and I love Boy's Life. But Swan Song, just absolutely amazing, guys. I, I think that's not only uh, the best book I read in 2022, it's one of the best books I've read. And that is why it's on this list. But also in 2022 was my introduction to Bernard Cornwell. And I decided to read the Warlord Chronicles. A big, big fan of Thomas Mallory's Arthurian legend. So the fact that someone was going to take it and try to put a kind of a historical fiction approach to it, I knew that I was going to be getting some things very different than what Mallory gave us. And it was welcome. I was fine with that. He made some decisions. I was like, I'm not really sure about that. But as its own thing, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. The hardest thing here was picking one of them. But I do think I'd go with Enemy of God. That's book number two in the series because of the dad shit, as I called it. There's some stuff where, you know, Durfel's a parent now and he's adjusting to this new life with kids while still being part of a war band, you know. And it's just, it has some stuff that will absolutely cut you to the bone. And if you don't feel it, you either don't have a heart or you don't have kids. <laughs> I'm not really sure which, but it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I, it's nothing you never expect because you expect everything to be down and gritty and dirty. And if this is wartime we're talking about here, but it has some really, really touching stuff in it and some things that I, I just don't think that you'll be expecting. And not just because it's different than what Mallory wrote, but just because Bernard Cornwell keeps you guessing. And without a doubt, that guy writes the best one-on-one -on -one battles I've ever seen. Yes, he even surpassed Joe Abercrombie, who I didn't think could be surpassed in the one-on-one -on -one fight in the circle. Uh, Bernard Cornwell is a master. He does it very well. All of his battles are amazing. And that book is just stands above the rest of the trilogy. So that's it, right? No. I do already have one for 2023. If you guys watched my most re recent uh, weekly update, you'll know that that pick is Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb. Book number seven in the Realm of the Eldlings, book number one of the Tawny Man trilogy. And you would think usually with things like this, you need to set some time to let it marinate, you know? Uh, but here's the thing is I knew I was going to pick a Robin Hobb book. And I already said this is my favorite book in the Realm of the Eldlings. So it's the reason that I picked this one. Basically, guys, I feel like this is Robin, How Robin Hobb's powers reaching their full potential. This is what I wanted so bad in the Farshire trilogy. I felt like she just missed the mark. Something I felt like she was able to do in Live Ship is she didn't do the first person's perspective. I like that so much, but I don't like first person that much. It really kind of drives me crazy. But with with this is she brings it back to first person, but you can tell she's just so much more of, a, more of an awesome writer now. And she never once made me feel like I was only in Fitz's head because she gives so much good time in this dialogue between two characters that makes you really feel like I don't even know whose perspective I'm looking at anymore because the dialogue is so good. So uh, it's one of those books where a lot of people will say, I don't know, nothing really happens the first one third of it. If you love Slice of Life, Robin Hobb, this is the best I've seen it done since Stephen King, honestly. I feel like she's the only one that's kind of sitting at that same table of being able to give me just characters that I enjoy spending time with and just give me their daily life for the first 200 plus pages of this book and I'm all in for it. I, I'm fine if we just stay here. I'm fine if we just stay here and you're talking about these little things that we're talking about at the beginning of this book. But the book has much more than that, obviously. It has the quest. It has the heartbreak. It has the sorrow. It has the fun. It has the thrills. It has all the stuff that you've come to kind of expect in the realm. But also it has those moments that will make you be like, I also hate visiting this world because I always leave a sad sack by the end. But it's a, a an awesome book, an awesome book. And uh, I, I'm interested to see if, because people keep telling me this series gets better and better, if it gets better than this, man, that that's... That top 10 fantasy list is going to have to be adjusted, I think, sometime next year. But guys, that is the 15. I had to make a ton of tough cuts. I know a lot of people, I'll probably get more comments about what I left off than what I had on here. Here's the thing, guys. If I didn't mention your favorite book or your favorite author, again, this was some very, very tough cuts. Remember, I went through 322 books here. Those are very, very tough. I had to make some hard cuts. Like I was actually like screaming out loud because when I just 
first got out the pen and paper and jot these down, I had 32. I had 32, so I had to whittle it down from there. But also, you got to remember that maybe I haven't read that book yet, or maybe I read it before 2019. These are always things that are going to kind of go into this kind of kind of video. But uh, yeah, I, I think that these are the 15 that I would put up against anything else that I have read since I started this channel. And uh, I hope that you guys, if you haven't read any of these, maybe you'll give them a, a shot and check some of them out. Now, I know some of them are, are in the middle of a series. So you've got to kind of commit to a series to do that. Some of them you don't. But I hope that uh, this will give you an idea of some, maybe some authors or books that you've considered trying and you haven't yet because I think these are the ones that have left the most impression over me over these uh, three plus almost four years now since doing this channel. So guys, what are some of the favorite books that you've read? Let's say since 2019, what are some of your favorites? I think that that'd be a fun conversation to have down in the comments. Why don't you do that guys? And I will talk to you there.